it was mostly fun. It was like a, a continuous process of learning. I just had information coming to me and I just couldn't get enough of it. So I was constantly learning, but at the time, it was like the early 90s, like most people didn't understand hip hop, like sagging your pants, like got you into trouble, you know? Uh, I'd go to my friend's uh, house and then you have to pull up your pants because the father is not gonna accept that. You know, even in the streets, like people were like, ah, eat you son. Yeah, yeah, my man. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's like, it was, it was difficult to be understood and accepted by like my community, but then at the same time, like, the, the, the love that I got within the hip-hop community just like inspired me just to keep learning and learning and learning. Cool. Hey, it's actually quite similar. And the first time we met, in fact, was at hip-hop shows back in the day. When all the shows in Soweto were like Splash Jam, Dungeon Shack, 1808, Graveside, those, all those kind of hip-hop shows that, that we used to attend. I used to rap as well. Well, I still rap, but I started with rap, yeah. Uh, I was in a crew in, in Middlelands, from, from Zone 3 Middlelands. And we started with rap, and that's how I started arts, really. Becoming a performer, I started with, with rap. And so in a way, that links language and performance quite clearly. And then, and then after that, I ended up studying, going to Fitz and studied theatre. Yeah. And at the same time, I studied linguistics, and then I really got into, into the science of language. Because linguistics is the science of language. I had one, my supervisor for, for my honors thesis was a professor called Maxwell Kateng from Zimbabwe. And he, he's a phonologist, so he works with sounds of language. And he always goes home, and then I ask him, but we understand, Maxwell, that you are a professor in Johannesburg, but what is it that you do exactly? What is this linguistics? So he always explains it. He's like a mechanic of language. He, he opens the car of language and checks all the, the, the things, the engine and everything. You understand. It doesn't mean that you drive every car. It, don't mean, it doesn't mean you speak every language. People usually say, oh, you're a linguist. How many languages do you speak? <laughs> it's not about speaking many languages. It's about understanding the way language works, the internal structure of language. And so that, to me, was exciting because from a hip-hop perspective, you know, it's quite technical. You know, often when, when you're working deeply in hip-hop, it's, very, it's, it's really technical arts. So you, you're dealing with very minute details of, of the way words and rhythm create in terms of rap and the way uh, samples and DJ, the minutia of movement and sound. Even, even with, with just rap alone, there's so much technical things, like it's like the articulation, you've got to learn to flip the tongue. Like, I also started off with rapping, like, you've got to learn to flip the tongue. That means you rap for so long, your tongue gets tired, and you still have the ability to, keep, to control your tongue. And also, there's a lot of thinking involved, because you can't just say anything, because that might spark a battle. So you've got to have control of your words, you've got to articulate, you've got to understand the flow as well. So you're rapping to the beat. And then also your rhyme technique has to be decent. So you've got to be able to rhyme in couplets. You don't just rhyme one word. Rap is, is very technical and, and that's what got me into thinking the way I think, about interrogating things, getting into the core of things, looking at things at every possible angle. Because of, of rap. And Toy is trying to find the alternative that we've been speaking mm. about a lot. When you're writing raps, certain sounds are more difficult to say than others because they're more complex. Like it's more difficult to say skr or skr than it is to say p or t. So sometimes you, you're changing the, the words so that it's more easier to pronounce so that you can, you can f your, your flow is, is, it comes, rolls off the tongue better. So you're dealing with the minutia of sound when, you, when you're a flow type rapper. And I think that's how I got into linguistics and phonology, the sounds of language, is, is through rap. Even my, my main work is about backwards languages. Yeah, look, I can summarize by saying this. Art and science, they go together. Even if you look at the word for art, like Nesu, Uktivo. Uktivo, it means art, but it means skills, really. It's technical skill, actually. As, and art. Talk about you know, the, the, the arts of the, of the mouth, as in verbal arts. That's usually the sense that we, we speak about when we talk about 
it, in general, that if you just say that alone, it usually means oratory arts, speaking arts, like in Kanekwan is a type of or as in folk tales, or Isbom, you know? Isbom, yeah. Yeah, so those kind of, <coughs> of, of traditional arts, so that's praise poems, so called praise poems and folk tales in Kanekwan. This type of arts of the mouth, Tsigo So immediately, there's this element of language as well, and, uh, and the idea that arts and the skills, science, things go together. So for me, I've got into the science of language through arts, through wanting to be a better rapper. I wanted to be able to flow on the snare. <laughs> and then it's so difficult in Ngesenguni because you find that the second last syllable of every phrase is lengthened. So bona pambili. E is lengthened. The A is lengthened there. So you always have this, this extra vowel that if you're rhyming with that, it's, rhythmically it's quite fixed as opposed to in English. Like I said, we're sitting on the couch. 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 You know, all of those have meaning, but you can't see. You know? Stay this offense. Stay this offense. It's so fake. It doesn't make it doesn't it doesn't change the meaning. It, it doesn't it just sounds like you're saying it weird. But then I heard the song of Oda Miesta called Wena Uban. I don't know if anyone remembers yeah. it. Wena Uban, Wena Uban in my and then the verse goes, says says he left him. Says Wonna ko si hetepe i hai bifa. So says he kilefi, says figi. Says one now call, says call. See, head tepe, see pet. If I be fine, if I. So then I noticed that this way of reversing language and putting the one syllable at the end, you have a punctuation mark there. You have a, a, a rhythmic punctuation. It says, he get a fee. It says, one now call. And I was like, if that comes in on the snare, that's going to sound great. But, so like, yeah. but don't kids do the same thing in English as well? Like yeah. New Yorkians, like Kizesh, Stizesh. Exactly, yeah. Those are all types of manipulation, manipulating the, the, the surface form of the language. So even in, in English, all things, there's pig Latin where you say, we are, it, we are eating say on the offer say. So you, you take the first uh, letter and you put it at the end and you add A. So I'm Ulepe, you know? You know, Andy let's say. So that's actually a similar mm. thing as, or you know, or Andy let's say. So that's mm. that's how you'd say it in a jambu, you know. Ule pu. Says igile fi. And there's lots of variations of those ways of manipulating the surface form of language to create something that sounds rhythmically different and sounds sometimes foreign. Like if you hear people in Durban, in Le Monde, the way they use that secret language, you won't understand what they're saying at all. You're like, we am Zinarela And you're like, what is that? But it, they're reversing language, they're reversing words and they're adding things between the words. If you know the code, you can interpret it. But it just, it's an alternate way of speaking. It's an alternate. These things are universal in a way. There's alternates. Mm. There's another way of speaking, of living, that always is parallel to the normal way of living. And that's what's really interesting as well, as well about what we're doing with the writing systems and Sandila's work as well, of refiguring letters, refiguring writing in different alternate ways that you, that you didn't see it like that before. You suddenly, you're just flipping mm. it on people. Because like that was the, my journey to hip hop, which was like deciphering this code of the streets. Like you hear Bozak, what's that? You don't know. So you have to listen and contextually figure out the meaning. And then if another rapper uses the same word in a different sentence, then you, you, you have two contexts for you to compare with. And eventually you crack the slang, you crack the code. And that's how like you, that's how you become down. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's. It's how you, yeah, it's like how you become a clever as opposed to a pirate. Yeah. If you're a parry, you don't know those things. If you're a clever, you know that. You're a manocha, you're notching those things. For jailing those things. As they would say, they're young foche, they're young jafoana. That's how they would express it. What drew me to graffiti is, is this is an emphasis on decorating forms, like letter forms, 
ornamentation of letter forms, which is like, besides calligraphy, at the time I knew nothing else that did that. Uh, so the emphasis is your name. You're writing your name, and you, the point is to get your name up as many times as possible, as big as possible, and as bold as this possible. And, and also graffiti is a code, so like, there's an A that everybody knows, that's the pyramid A, like that's how you learn your alphabet soup, and then there's the B, there's like cope two. <laughs> so you learn your alphabet soup from, from the, the, the pioneers, like you check out cope two's alphabet soup, maybe if you're lucky, you go online, you look for these things, so you learn the same A's, the same B's, the same C's, the same T's, and what happens from there on, like you start to put your own extensions on these letters, like so you, you put your own extent, like that's how you figure out crews as well, crews, because they chill together and they practice together. So they kind of like have more or less similar extensions on these lines and each person puts their own extensions and that's how styles evolve. Like that's how you figure out, oh, this dude is from Cape Town. You have ne you've never met the guy. Like I've like, I'm familiar with people that I've never met just by virtue of graffiti because I've been seeing this stuff so many times and for years as well. And I've seen this stuff evolve and I understand so much about them, but I've never met this person. So you can figure out like, okay, this is a new, typical New York style, typical California, Philadelphia, because uh, the lettering is insane and the, the use of space with the lettering is insane as well. Same thing with Joburg, like, ah, okay. Even like how long a person has been doing graffiti, you can just tell by the fluidity of the, of the, of the mark making, like, oh, it's, it's an old school cat. Where's this guy from, you know? It's the first time you see this, but you know this guy's been writing for a very long time. You can't do an A like that starting like two years ago. So there's a, like a whole lot of, there's a coded a language that's happening within the graffiti community that we don't want people that are outside the community to figure out. So like when people are like, what are you writing? I'll never tell them, no, like, oh, it's my name. <laughs> What's your name, Sandy? <laughs> but it's not what I'm writing, you know? Because uh, the, the idea is for you to crack the code. Because uh, I've like had pieces like, that I've kept for like 10 years trying to figure out what does this say? And I've been arguing with my friends, it's a D, no, it's not a D, it's a P. And we're out for years, like maybe like six years later, one person cracks it, no, this is what it says. Oh, flip it. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. Once you crack the code, then you're confident that you know the style. And, like, and you uh, develop your style just by understanding other people's style, then you create your own variation of style. Yeah. So it's kind of like similar to finding your own style of rapping. It's like same thing with craft, you're finding your own signature, your own hand style, your own movements. It's like accents as well, speech accents in terms of you can tell where someone's from from their accent, the same way you can tell where someone's from from their letter form. If you see guys spacing out their letters, you know that's like Brazil style. South American guys do that. And then New York guys will, put, will squeeze their letters and letters will balance on top of each other. And also there's also old school, new school, then like European style is also distinct. You, you look at it once, okay, that's you. And then like Eastern Europe is like amazing. <laughs> like if you see stuff from Poland, you immediately tell, like, because they got such an, a, an advanced understanding of how graffiti can fit within the fine art realm. So like they're doing installation, even the way they, they think of their letters and, and compose their letters, is like aesthetically, it's so easy for a fine artist to actually make sense of what they're doing and like find a way of locating the practice yeah. within the gallery setting. So like if you check out like Eastern European cats, like they, they always, maybe it doesn't do with communism in, in Eastern Europe and abstraction, but then the abstraction for Eastern European, Polish cats especially, it's so natural. Like the way they think of letters is so different to South Americans, to New York guys. And Africa is just South Africa mostly. There's nothing much in the rest of Africa craft wise. You hardly see anything. You know, visual logic, you know, there's a, there's a way we think about visual forms that is so informed culturally, you know. And sometimes we forget that. And then also that's the thing with this paper is that is to, to refine Southern African visual logic, you know, and you use that as a way of conveying everyday writing. Because that is something that's it's there, it's just, under, it's just like an alternate, it's underneath, it's always been there. If you look like at Shembe Church, it's those things they wear, those, those, those designs, they, they have meaning. Even with, uh, with, uh, with the beer vessels, like, there's so many meanings in it. The first meaning is the size of the beer vessel. That tells you what kind of uh, event you're having. 
and, and there's different kinds of beer vessels that are informed by the area that the beer vessel was made. And each family has its own decoration of the beer vessel. So like when somebody from a, the area sees that vessel, they, they know like the Shabalala, you know? Uh -huh. And then when Shabalala takes out this vessel with this vessel and there's this on the house, yes. oh, so there's an event, somebody's getting married. So exactly. it's, these are like methods of uh, communications that have existed. Like, and also, the, the problem is like with the research that's been happening, it, it's, it's kind of problematic because some people cannot access that kind of information for various reasons. But like with the decorations on each beer vessel, there is so much information that speaks about who made it, where is it made from, what is it made for. Exactly. But like most of the time you read about these, there's like, no, it's just decorative, decorative. But why would somebody spend so much time and put so much thought into something purely for decorative purposes? And also, why would there be such repetition of particular forms? You know, if it was just decorative, people would just go wild. But it's actually, a, it's actually the, those things are conserved because they have meaning. So like we were looking at one of those things, oh, come on, umshadu, because mm. it's written there, mm. a symbol of umshadu. Mm. It's a wedding symbol. And that you can find it in Kredomuto's books, in, in Dabu My Children, you can find those symbols listed. You see the wedding one, then you go and look at, at, at the ukamba, the, the pot, and you can say, oh, this is ukamba Ramshad, because it's written there, actually. It's got a symbol for, for a wedding, so you know that. In a basket, and there's certain, like for example, a basket would, would be woven with a design, right? And in the design, it would be a triangle. And then inside the triangle, there would be a, an hourglass shape. The, the, no, I mean a diamond. A diamond and the inside is an hourglass shape. So the diamond is, is representing a married woman. Inside is representing a married man. So that means that the woman is marrying a man who's already married. In other words, it's a, it's a subsequent mm. wife. And then you've got the designs like this. And each point represents a head of cattle. So then you understand how much was the lobolo from looking at that thing. So that was the, the gift that's presented for the wedding, which has all that information coded in it, all the relationship information. So, and that thing, it's not just decoration, it has all that symbolic logic. So the way we understand Diti Matra Dinuku is Soshamvu is growing out of that tradition of geometric symbolic logics. Coded as well. Coded, coded highly is, coded. Is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, coded logic that is visual. Um, that is an art as well, but, but also you know, symbolic, so it's symbolic arts. That's why we say, is pekre so shampu, mushelo lok loba, amazwe ez limze sintu, olune simo ez vela eptribo bom tabobo. So that means, is pekre so shampu is a system for writing words in indigenous languages that has a form that arises from traditional symbolic arts. Uptribo bom tabobo. Ke mukwalo wadipuo tasetso. In hip hop terms, you have to pay your dues. You have to pay your dues. And also, um, it's because the information is so important. Yes. You don't want people to take it for granted. Yes. So if somebody is really, really interested in learning this, they will make an effort and they will treasure it and they will respect it. But if it's like readily available and people take it for granted, like Zulu Matabu speaks about, is like um, there's written stuff and the stuff that works with you with the fo that stays in the fore of your memory. So. All the stuff that you need to remember, you don't write it, because once you write it, you can close the book and forget about it. So the most important information is communicated, so it stays in your, in your, in your memory, in, your, in the fore of your memory. Yeah. And only like the, the, the secret stuff gets written, because those things you can afford to forget. So it's a, it's a way of, 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 of placing importance on the information, what is important and what's not important. So when you code something, it's like saying like, yo, this is like serious to us. This is no joke. Not anybody can be down with this. So you gotta know your APCs yeah. before you can, you, can, you can read graffiti. So which is the opposite. Like I'm trying to maintain that and yet make the aesthetic accessible to somebody who's not necessarily interested in reading graffiti. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Like, but the work is informed by the traditions and the codes of graffiti. So like a lot of the stuff that I have is coded and people don't even know and until I tell them. Like most of the time they're like, wow, this is nice colors. This is it's a graffiti aesthetic. And, and this, there's a point that I'm making with this, but I won't tell them until I feel comfortable enough with them to say, okay, I can talk to you about this. Because sometimes the information is sensitive, you know, can be arrested and things. Mm. <laughs> or like 
for example, like with, with the backwards languages, the, the style of Istotzi that, that is a coded Istotzi, that kind of thing, it was even used, like, I heard stories about in La Montville, in, in Laxi and Durban, like, you, this was used during struggle times, like, you have Impimpi next to you, you're not sure whether this person is Impimpi or not. And then you, 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 talk, you talk to someone in the code. So, we are Zinarelo, we are Zinarelo, we are Zinarelo, we Zinarela means do you know? Lomtuana means this guy. A sign dronja means on the side. Galondi means on Londi side, which meaning the left hand side. If you said sign dronja Rebecca, it would be the right hand side. Mm. You see? So you, now you're saying, do you know this guy on your left hand side? He doesn't hear you. Because now when you're in the hood, there times, you, you speak Zulu, they understand, obvious. You speak Sotho, they all understand. You speak Afrikaans, they understand. You speak English, they understand. So what do you speak? You speak this is istando. They call it istando. And then that's what you speak. To throw this person, that's what you say. To throw that guy to the side. Mm. And then I was thinking about how writing itself often is an occult thing. So in the same way that graffiti is occult, it's in other words, it's rarefied. It's for a specific community for using in a specific way. It's not for everyone. And writing so often in human history has been that. It's for a specific community to write because it's sensitive things that are written. You know? So for instance, in Nigerian writing, the Be uh, system of writing, which is called Ntsibidi, which is the Be, Be means a, a leopard. It's a leopard, the leopard cult, the leopard society. That's a, that, it was a very secret society and they used to write in this. It's not, it wasn't, that writing wasn't for everyone. It was, and even uh, Ditima and, 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 and uh, like Izimbauze Sin to that Fredo Muta talks about, that's for Izangom. It's for, it's for traditional healers to understand those things. It's not for everyone. You, those, so there, there's been times in the history of writing where writing has been for a rarefied group. It's a code that is used to to, to record sensitive information or information that shows your membership in a particular group. So the, the idea that, that writing is now very democratic and universal, it's not always been the case, and it's still not the case in many different kinds of... And I mean, we know that academic writing is only for academics who don't necessarily understand... No, what the no as well. Legal jargon. Legal jargon. You have jargon in every field. In every field. For that reason. To, to show group membership. So socially, that's how it works. The code shows whether you, you know, outside yeah. the group. And if you know the thing, then you can. So if you know a lot of things, you can look like you're, you're everywhere. And you can participate in everything, you know. But most of the time, it's about you've paid your dues. You've been there. You know the system because you've learned it. And that shows wh what your history is. So history is contained in the, in, the, in the way you are able to communicate visually and linguistically. Your history is contained. People can read into that. We're reading into that all the time. This, this person says uh, they speak Afrikaans, but they don't say rrr, they say rrr. Therefore, they're probably from like Vusta, a place where they have a bray, you know? So we know that socially where that person comes from. This person, as we said, Tando and Tando, then we locate the person. Yeah, big time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a story I was telling about those guys who came from the US. Where were they from? When oh, yeah. There's some guys from DC. They're like the, the graph artists and whatnot. And like, like you ask like a few basic questions, you know, like all writers know these. Like, number one, they don't call themselves writers. They're graffiti artists. That's like, like that's, that's the first. That's like a uh, <laughs> red flag, you know. It's a warning. Like this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. No, we're graph artists. Like, okay, so like you, what do you guys write? And this guy doesn't understand what I'm saying. So already I know, like, and I know. And now I don't want to, like, like, make it obvious to everybody. Like, they'll figure it out for themselves. And then, like, uh, yeah, I'm a graffiti artist. I do this and this and this and that. And, 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 like, and like, also, you're rolling with, like, old schoolish, like, graph writers, like, serious writers. They don't even realize what's happening in front of them. But by the end of the session, this guy was, like, asking him to help him do his lines straight and, like, fix this and fix that. But then, like, he can ride on the fact that he's a graph rider uh, because people don't know the culture. So you say you're a graph rider, they believe you because they, they cannot tell the difference between a wannabe and a real graph rider. Mm -hmm. And then this guy left all the way from D.C. to South Africa doing research at UNISA on this graffiti thing that he knows nothing about. Yeah. Nothing. And they're from America, now we assume hip-hop things is American things, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. Hip-hop is a universal folk art. 
And if you know that thing... It's the almighty know. universal Zulu nation, that's hip-hop. Yeah. <laughs> that's number one, that's the basis yeah, of Yeah, that's hip-hop. Africa Bambata. Africa Bam, yeah, <laughs> that's Africa, the basis of hip-hop. Africa Bambata was one of the three so, so, mythological founders of hip-hop. He watched a movie about Amazulu. And he came to and he came and to KZN. And, yeah, KZ and, and then, then he, he, he turned this gang, like it was a, uh, like the a space, street gang called space. the Black Spades. He turned that into like a humanist organization for hip hop. So he's like the organization with all its ranks and everything. He flipped it to make it something to do with arts as opposed to something to do with street crime. Yeah, then he made Zulu chiefs and, and Zulu kings. So that's, like, now it's called the Universal Zulu Nation. I think the almighty called. Universal Zulu Nation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.